want to welcome everybody to today's uh, conversation with Professor Rachel Moran and Professor Mark um, Osler. We are um, going to be talking about important trial coverage uh, this afternoon. We have already received a number of questions from the community, and I do not want to keep us from being able to get into that conversation. We also will invite your questions uh, via the chat. So if you'd like to um, ask this distinguished panel um, to share their opinions or observations on any aspects, either of the Rittenhouse uh, or the Ahmed Aubrey case, or even the Kim Potter case, you're certainly welcome to do that. We're very fortunate at the university to have these distinguished scholars with us. And we're very grateful for them taking the time out uh, to spend some time with us today to talk about these cases. I'd like to begin by introducing both of my colleagues. First and foremost, Rachel Moran is an associate professor, founder of the Criminal and Juvenile Defense Clinic at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. Um, the 2020 graduating class selected her as the law school's professor of the year. Moran focuses her scholarship on issues pertaining to police accountability, policing reform, and public access to records of police misconduct. In 2019, she was named the Bellow Scholar of Biennial National Recognition for Clinical Professors Engaged in Empirical Research that has a significant potential to improve the quality of justice. In 2021, she received the Dean's Award for Excellence in Scholarship, and her articles have appeared in the Boston College Law Review, UC Irvine Law Review, Washington Law Review, Cordoza Law Review, Villanova Law Review, and the Buffalo Law Review, among others. Her work has also been cited in CNN, The Economist, Vox, Bloomberg News, and many other media outlets. I should also note that following Dr. Moran on Twitter makes you smarter. Next, I would like to introduce my colleague, Mark Osler. Professor Oster's work advocates for sentencing and clemency policies rooted in principles of human dignity. In 2016 and 2019, the graduating class chose him as Professor of the Year. And in 2015, he won the Dean's Award for Outstanding Scholarship. And in 2013, received the Outstanding Teaching Award. Oster's writing on clemency, sentencing, and narcotics, po narcotics policy has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and law journals at Harvard, Stanford, the University of Chicago, Northwestern, Georgetown, Ohio State, UNC, William & Mary, and Rutgers. His University of Chicago Law Review article was highlighted in the lead editorial in the New York Times, in which the Times editorial board expressly embraced Osler's argument for clemency reform. I am going to, because uh, I could read for days about both of these incredible scholars, stop those bios there. I will be sharing those in the chat. I will also be sharing pieces uh, that both of my colleagues have published recently uh, in the chat as well. But let's jump right into this conversation. So I'd like to begin um, with an interesting question that we received from the community. Um, and it states, we've seen so many cases of vigilantes or police officers killing people. Then many debates on if it was warranted, if it was self-defense, what kind of person was the victim, et cetera. Are these murders and trials an inevitable part of our system? Does an ideal justice system still entrust officers with the ability to kill? I'm gonna to turn to you first, uh, Dr. Osler, to tackle that. Sure, um, and I, first of all, Dr. Osler is my wife um, who teaches history at St. Thomas, but um, I, you know, it's an important question, and it, it goes a lot of different directions. And one is this police violence. Um, does it go on forever? Can we stem it? And the answer is, is yes. I mean, we can do a lot about it. Will we ever eradicate any wrong completely? Probably not. But the level of police violence, especially racialized police violence, is is completely unacceptable. And there's disparate outcomes that reflect the racism that is in the society as a whole. And you can't get past that. One of the things that drives these incidents over and over again is that there's some people in criminal, the criminal justice system we give a lot of discretion to. Um, prosecutors. I was a federal prosecutor. I had the ability to choose who we charged and with what. Police officers on the street have a lot of discretion too. And if we accept that there is racism in our system, implicit bias and explicit bias, it is going to get into those discretionary decisions that people make unless we find a way to cabin them or have different people make those decisions. And, and that's a big part of what the project is. Now, extending forward a little bit, when we look at Rittenhouse, the Rittenhouse case and the McMichael case that were the death of Ahmaud Arbery, um, 
there we're extending that problem of discretion from the police where it's already troubling to the community at large to act as vigilantes. And that's part of what that, that connecting tissue is between all these cases is who has the discretion and what are the problems with underlying bias when we extend that discretion? Thank you, Professor Osler. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Moran, your thoughts? Sure, I'll seize on just a different aspect of the question. Um, that, that part of the question asking whether this is a, um, an ideal, do we have an ideal justice system? And is this an inevitable outcome of our criminal system? I think is a really interesting one. I've been reflecting a lot recently um, in both of these trials and also the upcoming trial of former officer Kim Potter um, about why outcomes of criminal trials are so often dissatisfying to large portions of the public. And part of that, of course, is people have different opinions about what should happen. So inevitably, someone's going to be dissatisfied. But I think that there's a bigger um, issue at stake, which is a lot of people look to the criminal system to provide almost a moral answer as to what whether the person on trial, whether their behavior was right. We saw a lot of that in the Rittenhouse trial in particular, where people who were upset that he was acquitted felt like it was a justification of his behavior. And, you know, as a lawyer, I can say, well, criminal trials are about specific things. Could the state prove certain elements of the crimes he was charged with? But I think that's dissatisfying to a lot of folks. They want the criminal system to speak more broadly about whether behavior was appropriate or not. And that's not how our system tends to work. So I don't, um, it would be a much longer conversation about how, whether or how that should be fixed. Uh, but I do want to say part of the dissatisfaction is because I think oftentimes people are very understandably looking for um, the trial, the verdicts to kind of uh, represent a morality judgment about what happened. And that's not always how our system functions. You know, and just to go back on one thing that, you know, do we, should we entrust officers with the ability to kill? That's a tough question. I, I mean, the, the, the better question is how often should we entrust officers with the ability to kill? I mean, there was an incident just uh, yesterday or last night in an outer suburb where someone got into a car, or this is all, you know, the early reports, and we know how those go, sometimes they change, but the early reports are that, that a man got into a car, forced the driver to drive to a liquor store, was armed, goes into the liquor store, forces the people out of the store. They were allowed to leave voluntarily. The police come in, he's leveling the gun at them. You know, there you've got someone who's an armed threat within the community who's committing violent crimes um, and, then, and then threatening the police. And, it's, it, and if those facts turn out to be what really happened, then that's a much more justified killing than some of which the others that we see. Um, but that's not what we see in so many of these cases. I mean, for example, consider a case that's, that's not on our agenda necessarily, but is on the, the minds of a lot of people still, Breonna Taylor, where we had a woman who was asleep and they're doing a drug raid on her boyfriend and they, they come in, you know, they come in with guns. I mean, as a, as a prosecutor, I used to work on staging these raids. I know how they go. They're incredibly violent. Um, and, and she was shot dead, a complete innocent, the entire thing. But the question there that goes unasked is, why do that raid? Are, is that the negligible amount of drugs that they're gonna interdict really worth bringing that violence into the community? And even if it is, to, to arrest that person or to search that house, is it necessary to go in at six o'clock in the morning with a guy on point in a shot, with a shotgun shooting the dog, you know, going through the house, putting people on the ground, when we could just wait till everybody leaves and, and search the house. Um, we, where we have this problem in, with trusting the police with the ability to kill most often is when the police have the ability to provoke violence. And that's what we saw, for example, with, with the death of George Floyd. That's what we saw with Breonna Taylor. That's what we're seeing with these vigilantes as well. 
So let's spend some time and talk about the vigilantes uh, for, for just a second, because I, I do think that's an important distinction here. A lot of people want to draw comparisons between this and the Chauvin trial, certainly the upcoming Potter trial, and we have a number of questions uh, for both of you um, from the uh, our participants who want to hear about your take on that. But in this particular case, I think um, certainly for Rittenhouse and certainly in the case of the three uh, individuals who were ultimately found guilty for uh, the murder of Ahmed Aubrey, uh, the reality is this is an extension of the Castle Doctrine, at least in the case of Rittenhouse, into the public square, as you talked about, Mark, which is problematic. And then, um, Rachel, with regard to the Ahmed Aubrey case, um, kind of a, a repudiation in some sense of that extension in these gentlemen assuming um, their role as officers of the, of the law and as citizens arrested, so on and so forth. What do people need to know about the Castle Doctrine? What is it? I think there's a lot of misunderstanding from people about what that um, exactly is. And then secondly, are you troubled at all by the extension, as you talked about, Mark, of that, you know, pushing that into um, the public sp uh, sphere in such a way that you know, a lot of the more recent cases that we're talking about really pivot on people being able to make the case that they felt threatened and they took action um, because they perceived that threat. Are these two verdicts sending different uh, messages with regard to that principle? We'll start with you first, uh, Professor Moran. I don't think the two verdicts necessarily send different messages. I know that um, the outcomes are different and it's um, tempting to latch on to that, but they did involve different facts. Um, I will be frank, very troubling facts in both cases, but also different. Um, Georgia's in particular, I'll speak to the um, gentleman, Gregory and Travis McMichael and Roddy Br Bryan, their neighbor who were charged with and convicted of the murder of Mr. Arbery. Um, the, it's a little bit different than the Castle Doctrine, but I think this is answering your question, Dr. Williams. Um, the issue in that case was a citizens arrest law primarily that was passed in 1863. Um, we need to think about the context of 1863 Georgia, still a slaveholding state. Um, and the history of that law is essentially enabling white citizens to make arrests of uh, the law. I don't, I don't believe had uh, racialized language explicit in it at the time. Um, it certainly didn't in 2020, but that was the history of that law. Essentially, um, it's been referred to as the slave catcher law. Um, and what it did, what it did in 2020 when this um, murder happened was say that a citizen, if a citizen, so a non-police officer, just an ordinary civilian, if they reasonably suspect that they have uh, that someone else has committed a felony, they are allowed to attempt to make a citizen's arrest and even to perpetrate force in making that arrest. Well, um, this goes back to the issue of discretion that Professor Osler brought up, but that's in incredibly troubling to uh, entrust civilians with the decision about whether they reasonably suspect a felony has occurred. And um, bias, that's, a, that's an issue rampant uh, that creates a rampant opportunity for bias. And I think we can confidently say that bias was part of the decision in this process by the McMichaels and by Mr. Bryan to chase a black man through their neighborhood who uh, he had apparently been seen in a um, house that was under construction, but they had no evidence that he had committed a crime in that space. Um, there is evidence that they uh, used a racial slur when, when referring to him afterwards. That evidence was not introduced at trial, but it is um, part of what we know about the case. And you have three white men chasing a black man through a neighborhood because they didn't think he belonged. And so they decided that they suspected him of having committed perhaps a burglary. Um, and that law, that citizen's arrest law is what could have been their, that was their defense primarily. They also uh, uh, raised self-defense as a defense, but primarily they were relying on the citizen's arrest law. And I say what, uh, I. I've been referring to it in the past tense because it has since been repealed. The governor of Georgia um, has did sign off on a repeal of that law, so it's no longer in effect. Um, 
And the jury rejected its application. They, they uh, rejected the idea that the, uh, those three men reasonably suspected Ahmad Arbery of committing a felony. But it, that law enabled the prospect of vigilanteism in a way that I think we should be really concerned about. Yeah, and just to, um, Dr. Williams, to define a couple terms here too. We talk about the Castle Doctrine that, you know, within the law of Minnesota, for example, that means that if someone comes into your home and you perceive they're there to commit a serious crime, that you can use lethal force, even if it's not strictly self-defense. And these are th all things are extension of self-defense. Um, beyond that, we've got stand your ground laws in some states, not here, but there is a stand your ground law, for example, in Florida. We saw that in the Travion Martin, George Zimmerman case, where that involves if you are in a confrontation with somebody um, where you're using lethal force, you don't have the duty to withdraw if possible. Um, and here in these two cases, what we've got in play is, is a more pure um, self-defense um, claim. And they're different, but they're the same in a way. I mean, with Rittenhouse, there was probably a clearer case for self-defense because there were people literally going after him. Um, and, you know, in the, the McMichael and uh, case, there they were going, they, you know, they instigated it, they went after him. But the, the commonality that's interesting here is that in both cases, the, the self-defense claim came from originally defending property with guns, not people, and not someone coming into your house. But with Rittenhouse, you know, he got a gun and went to Wisconsin from Illinois to protect a used car lot. Um, you know, that's why he was there. And then he got, he got into, you know, um, predictably um, engagement with people where he used the gun. Um, and with, with the McMichael um, Bryan case there, you know, what are they worried about? Oh, someone is messing with this house across the street that's under construction that wasn't even theirs. Um, and so this sense of self-defense we have to recognize that what we're talking about really here is white people defending property that really starts the whole process. And that goes way back. Such a great um, point, Mark and Rachel. Thank you both for uh, acknowledging the history. Rachel, I wanna ask you, cause you've been very clear about this in articulating um, this as the McMichael Bryant case. Why are you referring to it that way? Well, I'm referring, it's certainly not the easiest way to refer to it because there are three defendants, but I think it's important. Um, I think names are really important in a lot of different contexts. And in this context, those are the men who were on trial and who were ultimately convicted. So I'm not criticizing any other use, but I'm referring it to, to it as the McMichael Bryan trial because those were actually the men on trial. Um, I think sometimes it's easy to slip into other language, and I get that, but that's, uh, that's, the, that's the principal choice I'm trying to make here, although it makes for some awkward logistics. I actually think it's a, it's a great principle in, in the sense that when you refer to it as the person who was ultimately victimized or killed, you take the onus off of the, the individuals who ultimately are on trial. More importantly, we saw this in the way that um, the defense talked about Mr. Arbery. Um, you, you, in some sense, double victimize the person in this particular case, at least in the case of the Arbery um, uh, case that, that I think in an unfortunate way, again, takes responsibility off of the people who engaged in the criminal act and, and makes the person who's the victim the centerpiece of that, which is problematic in and of itself. I also really appreciate both of your um, invocation of history here in terms of just being very clear about what the origins of those laws are. And that there are laws that we perhaps need to look at on the books in, in several states, including here in, a here in the state of Minnesota, that uh, potentially grew up in a period where they have clear ties to um, white supremacy, to the maintenance of slavery, so on and so forth, which continue to have echoes and reverberations in our criminal justice system. Um, it is not in, in any sense uh, unusual for us to suggest that it's important that we look at those elements of our laws because they um, can inflict harm, as we saw in this particular case. Uh, I did not watch the um, uh, testimony carefully, but the one day, a couple of days that I did watch, it was one of the defendants talking about how his mother had told him about that, um, uh, you know, citizen's arrest law. 
And so that's communicated, you know, not in a, a formal way, but, but by community and, and by a parent and so on and so forth. And you can imagine what a nightmare that would be for all of us to have people acting in that way in a civil society, assuming they have the, the ability to do that, uh, again, on a, in, in a very problematic understanding of what that law is. Um, I want to ask you both, we've got a couple of really great questions here, again, about Kim Potter, a lot of emphasis on Kim Potter, but let me wrap up at least this part I'm talking about uh, the McMichael uh, uh, case here. I have a question about the prosecutor in the Arbery case, Linda Dunikowski. She was brought in from the Atlanta area for the trial. She largely avoided race during the trial. She had to thread the needle very carefully here. The jury was almost all white from a more conservative area of Georgia. This New York Times article described her style as a strict high school principal. How much did her personality and moderate approach and decision not to directly mention race impact the result? That's the next question. Um, either one of you, chime in. Well, I'll, I'll, Jim, oh, go ahead. Well, just, just I, you know, I can tell you as a, as a former prosecutor myself that, that I thought she did a very good job. The thing about prosecutors is that they need to be focused on proving the elements. And those elements, except where you have racial animus as an element, which sometimes you do, um, are going to steer you very often away from explicit discussions of race. So there's, there's that. Um, the other thing is that we have to remember that she was not the first prosecutor assigned to this. She was the fourth. That it started out in Brunswick, um, and that prosecutor who chose not to bring charges, in fact, directed the police not to arrest the defendants. Um, her name, Jackie Johnson, and is now charged with obstructing the arrest in Georgia. And then it got transferred to a guy named George Barnhill in Waycross. Um, and he's the one who said, no, this is a citizen's arrest, and also didn't have these defendants arrested. Uh, and had ties to, to Greg McMichael, the elder one, who is a former police officer investigator. Um, and then a third office was assigned to it, and they felt they didn't have the resources. And finally, we ended up with it in Cobb County, where he got what I think was was pretty competent uh, prosecution. Rachel? Yeah, I just um, wanted to mention, I mean, whether it impacted the verdict, I guess we can't say for sure. She got the verdict that she was looking for, which were guilty verdicts on most of the murder charges. Um, my, I guess my concern is, so some of the evidence that was not introduced at trial, I mentioned already the um, Travis McMichael's use of a racial slur after the fact when referring to Ahmaud Arbery. Um, he had a Confederate flag on his license plate, which is perhaps um, a more complex issue. Um, but both uh, have possible, one, one is a clear racial animus, the other one is at least possible. Um, what, what troubles me about not using that information, it may have been a wise move strategically, um, but a lot of the speculation around why the prosecutor did not use that was that she had a jury of 11 white people and one black member, and that the defense had successfully excluded many potential black jurors from the case. Um, and if the prosecutor is making a decision because she has to cater to the white audience, I think that um, that is a, its own damning of our criminal system and the way the decisions the prosecutor is needing to make for trial. So I can entirely understand why people would be upset with that if that's why the prosecutor was choosing to avoid that. Now, the prosecutor hasn't spoken publicly about her choice. It may be that she was simply sticking to the elements, but I think um, issues like use of a racial slur are pertinent potentially to the elements in that they could reject the idea that these were just people who believe, reasonably believed that they were stopping someone who had committed a felony. I think it suggests other possible and very troubling motives. So um, I, the prosecutor got the verdict she wanted and she may very well have made a wise strategic decision, but the fact that she had to make, potentially had to make strategic decisions like that is its own indictment of how our process works. 
Uh, it's a very interesting point, um, Rachel, in this sense, when we consider that, and we all know, I mean, we're, we're not saying anything unique by saying that race is a third rail in American politics. That trial from the very beginning was racialized by the comments from um, the defense in terms of no black pastors in the courtroom, you know, efforts uh, to kind of color uh, the way that people were looking at and perceiving the presence of activists in that space to support the family, so on and so forth. So I think to your point, Mark, the prosecutor had a very difficult um, road to tow. And yet at the same time, and I think we all uh, should take to heart what uh, Professor Moran is suggesting, that in and of itself is an indictment when you can't name in the same way that Professor Moran had to name for us that this wasn't the Arbery case, when you have to name that race can't be explicitly introduced when clearly race was a motivating factor here, that's problematic. When you couple that with what um, Professor Osler shared with us, the fact that it went through uh, this process of, of various, various offices you know, declining to prosecute, and you think about the culture there, and you think about that against the backdrop of the long history of racial inequality in the state of Georgia, which is informed by a larger history of white supremacy in the United States, uh, these are things that, you know, you can't walk away from this verdict and simply assume that the, the right thing happened here and we're in a good place. I think there are deeper ways to think about uh, how we um, process and think about reform necessary for our system in order for it to create equity and justice for, for all. Mark? Yeah, just, you know, in the history of that area matters too. That, that um, you know, I've been there. Uh, there's a federal law enforcement training center in Brunswick. And it's, you know, the the inland city by the sea islands. Um, you know, in the, the sea islands, uh, there's, uh, all, you know, several um, up off of Beaufort, South Carolina, and then down into Georgia. They were occupied by the um, Union Navy in the Civil War. And that is where slaves were freed first, or almost first, I believe, um, and given land in some cases. Uh, and then since then, there's been the process of taking it all back, um, you know, through tax liens and things like that. I mean, Hilton Head was one of those islands. And you look at it now, obviously, it's, it's not a black controlled space. Um, and and the, the community where this happened, that's Antilla Shores, is in between Brunswick and um, going out to these islands. And so there is... Um, you know, the, the Gullah culture, all kinds of things that are really distinctive about that area that are going to play into these views, the bias, the, the way jurors see things. Great point. Thank you. Uh, Mark, I have to ask you because you raised this in an earlier question uh, before we again, or in answer to an early question, before we transition to questions about the Potter case. You talked about... Um, uh, the importance of prosecutors kind of rethinking, and you mentioned the Breonna Taylor case specifically, these types of raids. We know that Prosecutor Choi uh, here has made the decision to um, deal with the issue of traffic stops, very mm -hmm. similar action in Philadelphia and various other communities across the country. Are you Can you explain for the audience what's happening there and why it's important? And are you encouraged by this? Do you think this is the right move? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is that we call these pretext stops when police officers stop someone because there's a, you know, a, a pine tree air freshener on the rear view mirror, or there's expired tabs or, uh, you know, something like that. And, and really what they're looking for is something else. Um, one of the most telling statistics that I've come across, uh, a guy named Radley Belko had a list in the, the Washington Post of all the evidence of racism within law enforcement. And one of the most telling is that we see pretext stops overwhelmingly um, by proportion targeting minorities and particularly African-Americans in the daytime. And then it becomes much less at night when you can't tell the race of who's driving by. And so, um, you know, these, these pretext stops, uh, they do sometimes turn up drugs sometimes turn up guns that people shouldn't have, but usually they don't. They just turn up expired tabs or an air freshener. And again, this is something where we're having armed men enter a provocative situation. And, and given the existence of racial bias in our society, allowing that discretion as broadly as we do 
has led to disparate outcomes. And, and, and the measure of that isn't just when someone dies because they're shot by the police. If you talk to people in a community where this happens and there's racial disparities, they'll talk about the indignity of being singled out, to be stopped, to be held under suspicion for driving down the street. Something that I don't face, frankly. But that alienates people from the police. It alienates them people, people from the governmental structures that we need to all be a part of. And that cost is incalculable. Rachel, any thoughts on, on that? Well, you asked the question about um, clarifying what policies are actually in place. And I think that is a good segue into the trial of um, Ms. Potter. Um, Brooklyn Center, which is where Dante Wright was killed, um, has announced a number of efforts to reduce traffic stops or to reduce the possibility of violence during traffic stops. Um, Dr. Williams, you mentioned Ramsey County and Philadelphia. Um, they're all different. All these, all these municipalities are uh, doing slightly different things, but what they're all aimed at is reducing those encounters that Professor Asa was just talking about. So Philadelphia has by law actually banned police from making stops for things like the air freshener or the expired uh, tags. Those are the two reasons that Dante Wright was stopped and Philadelphia has by law banned those kinds of steps. So um, a broader way of looking at that, that is non-public safety related traffic offenses. So um, that's what John Choi is now refusing. So he has announced as his own office's policy, he's the prosecutor in Ramsey County, and he has announced that his office will not accept criminal cases that come as a result of traffic stops for non-safety related reasons. Brooklyn Center is still kind of working through its proposed policy changes, but it has also um, largely banned police officers from making arrests for um, misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor offenses. Instead, they are supposed to issue citations unless there's a threat of violence or a gun involved with the um, charge. So the Brooklyn Center is approaching this in a little bit of a different way, but, but by trying to reduce the number of arrests. And they have, they're also um, encouraging their police to reduce the number of non-public safety related traffic steps they engage in. So I know one of the big questions is um, what will happen in this trial of former officer Potter and how could anything ever achieve justice for Dante Wright? Those are really, really difficult questions, but um, there have been changes, broader policy changes coming out of that tragedy that may reduce the likelihood of further violent police civilian encounters. Thank you, um, Rachel. And that leads us into these uh, questions about the right trial. So we'll start with this one first. Looking forward to the Kim Potter case and the killing of Dante Wright, what can we expect? Jury selection begins tomorrow. How hard will it be to find an impartial jury? Talk us through what the jury will be asked to consider in this case. Um, Dante Wright was pulled over for expired tabs and air pressure hanging. hanging. Will, there, will, the, will there be policy changes to minimize uh, stops of these kinds? So I think we've spoke to some of that, but I think that the early part of that question certainly be appropriate. What should people expect? What should, they, what, what should they be um, expecting with regard to jury selection as well? Well, we were, we were talking about this right before uh, we went on, but the, the jury questionnaire is pretty fascinating in this case. It's more extensive than we usually see. Um, and it seems to be lifted almost whole from uh, the Derek Chauvin trial, frankly. And, and there's a couple of things that are really uh, distinctive about it. One is that it asks directly about attitudes that, um, you know, there's a, a whole section where, um, for example, people are asked to rate from one being strongly disagree to five strongly agree on things like I support defunding the police or police in my community make me feel safe. Uh, and um, there's also questions that seem more relevant to the Derek Chauvin trial than this one, perhaps. For example, did you or someone close to you participate in any of the demonstration or marches related to policing that took place in the Twin Cities areas in the last two years? And if you participated, did you carry a sign? What did it say? Um, 
And, and you know, with the Derek Chauvin trial, you could see how that would be especially relevant since those, the, those protests were primarily in reaction to the killing of George Floyd. Um, here, I worry a little bit about how those things might be used to remove people of color from the jury. Rachel? I think in some ways, um, it may be easier to get an impartial uh, jury or at least to seat a jury. There, um, it's certainly a trial that has received a great deal of publicity, but less so than um, around Mr. Floyd's murder. Uh, it's a more, more complex trial in many ways. Um, it is one that people may not have as strong opinions about where I think um, I th there's a concern I expressed uh, during the jury selection of the jurors who ultimately tried Mr. Chauvin's case um, that I think is also possible here, which is you're looking for people who don't have strong opinions about the case. Um, but you're also, many people have seen at least a little glimpse of what the evidence is, which is, um, I think, not nearly as much as with Mr. Floyd's murder, but many people have seen the video of Kim Potter shooting and killing Dante Wright. Um, and so you're trying to find people who have already, who don't have a strong opinion, but the prosecution is also looking for them to convict based on that evidence about which they want folks to have a strong opinion about. So there's a possibility that you end up with jurors who are simply uninformed or who have already previewed some of the state's evidence and don't feel strongly about it, which is a challenging conundrum anytime you're uh, looking at a case that has received a lot of publicity. But um, I would expect, in this case, I think they're only anticipating about a week for jury selection as opposed to the three weeks that were set aside for Mr. Chauvin's jury selection. Um, I do share the same concern as Professor Ostler that if they're to the extent they're reusing the same jury questionnaire, which they are, um, it could could be a tool for weeding out people who simply have concerns about police brutality or who have a strong opinion about the need to hold police accountable. Um, it doesn't actually mean that they would be unfit jurors for this case, but that could be how the questionnaire is used. So great insights from both of you. It, it's of course um, a historical fact for all of us to acknowledge that the Potter uh, shooting um, of Dante Wright came on the eve of the verdict coming down in the Chauvin case. And so the two are tied, I guess, in some sense in the minds of people, but how unusual is this? Um, Professor Oster, you spoke to it a little bit. Rachel, you um, echoed this. Should people be concerned about the, the, um, them reusing the same questionnaire? How, is, this, is this something that you've seen before? Is this very unusual? How people kind of understand why this is significant? Well, I mean, it's unusual to have a questionnaire that's this extensive and this specific, um, but we have to remember something, which is that we got a surprisingly um, representative jury in the Chauvin trial, that we, and we have a, a real problem with lack of representation in juries in this country, and for that one trial, we beat it, apparently, and, and we managed to have fair representation in the jury. Um, so, you know, that that worked. Um, I mean, maybe it wasn't the jury questionnaire that caused that. I think high participation um, by people in responding to the, the initial questionnaire and, and, and being up for jury service and, and the way that, uh, you know, the judge handled things too, um, played a role in that. And we'll see how this plays out. It, you know, I think there's things that may in the end be more important than the questionnaire in seeing how representative a jury we end up with back here in Hennepin County. Rachel? Yeah, it's definitely unusual. It's, there's nothing illegal about it. I'm not meaning to suggest that. It's, it's unusual to have such a specific um, questionnaire and such a lengthy one, but um, I don't, I have concerns about how attorneys could use it. Um, I think that this, uh, I think that this trial will involve um, a lot of potential for um, 
it's it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for people to listen to. Uh, you're going to see a very vigorous defense from the defense attorneys in this case, and they have already. They have filed motions. Um, I'm I'm looking at one that suggests that one of the things the jury needs to consider is whether Dante Wright caused his own death um, by his. Uh, not not immediately uh, by his resisting arrest is how they're um, framing it. And that's something that will make a lot of people really angry, but they are going to defend the case in that way. Um, and you then have, of course, the state is there. They've um, charged Officer Potter with two charges, first degree manslaughter and second degree manslaughter. They are alleging that she was reckless in her handling of the firearm um, in which she shot Dante Wright. They're not alleging that she intentionally killed him or that she meant to use the gun, but they're alleging that she was reckless in her handling of it and that she consciously disregarded a serious risk of death. Thank you, Rachel. Let, let's break this down a little bit. Um, I will say this, I didn't get a chance to say it in the very beginning. As a university, it's our responsibility to have difficult conversations about things sometimes in a new cycle and given the unprecedented moment that we're in, Historically, this is the appropriate space for us to, to dig into these cases. Um, it is uh, in, in no means an attempt to mandate orthodoxy or to say that there's you know, a, a particular viewpoint that any one person should have with regard to these cases. It's our attempt as an institution of higher learning to unpack this for our community so we can all be thinking about this um, as we go into this trial and as we are coming out of the Rittenhouse and the McMichael um, cases from last week. Having said that, um, Break this down for us, uh, Mark. Reckless disregard for human life, murder. Very different charges here. L three cases in particular. Um, Noir case, uh, Kim Potter, Chauvin. What's the difference here? B break down for people why this case is, is a case of reckless disregard, why the charges in Noir, why the, the charges in Chauvin. Why, why so different? Yeah, I mean, we've got one common charge in all of them, which is second degree manslaughter. And that's, in the end, what, what uh, Officer Noor was sentenced for. That is what, uh, you know, Chauvin was sentenced to that, but also for a second degree felony murder. And we see it here again in the Potter case. So, so second degree manslaughter is, is there. Now, there's a twist in the Potter case. And um, Professor Moran mentioned the language of it that talks about um, that it, there's a, um, she created an unreasonable risk and consciously took a chance of causing death. And that's that's where the rub is here, is that in these other cases, we know that uh, you know, Muhammad Noor intended to aim his gun. There is a, the, the context made it pretty clear that it was an intentional act. We know with Derek Chauvin, he intended to keep his knee on the neck of George Floyd as he was dying. Here we've got the, the question of mistake though. And so, you know, that defense of, well, I didn't make a conscious decision. I thought I was doing something else. And so that's something that we didn't see in, in the others. Um, you know, in a, a kind of a meta level, we've had the easy case for the prosecution, and that was Derek Chauvin. What we're going to have now are much harder cases. The Potter case is a much more difficult case for the prosecution. Um, you know, Keith Ellison's taking the lead on this, added that second charge just in September of the first degree manslaughter, which is a felony murder manslaughter um, based on reckless use of the gun. Um, and, and don't forget that we still have the three co-defendants of Derek Chauvin who are gonna come to trial uh, unless they plead out somehow. And there's the federal case against them as well. And the case against those other three officers is gonna be much more difficult than against Derek Chauvin because they're gonna say, you know, he was my training officer, we were following his directions. Um, and, and things like that. And so these are more difficult cases than Chauvin. Part of it's because of the way that the, you know, the, the video that many people have seen already does seem to reflect a mistake that, you know, she says, I'm going to tase you. She says, taser, taser, taser. And then she seems genuinely shocked that she used her gun. And that's really gonna be at the center of the defense case. It's a, it's a question of mistake that we didn't have in these other cases. Thank you, uh, Mark. One of the questions that we received, and I'm gonna um, edit this a little bit just because it's a longer question, is what should we expect in terms of the, if you're the defense, what will the arguments be 
um, with regard to defending her. And to your point, Mark, and to what you raised earlier, Rachel, there is the video here, which, as you pointed out, Mark, seems to indicate um, that this was a mistake. I mean, there, you know, any way that you look at it, there are things that she did, um, and we can talk about those other cases by um, comparison. I love your analysis of noir and the intent, the question of intent, but it does come down to parsing, you know, all of these things and, and caging them in terms of will the video in Potter case factor heavily into the defense for Kim Potter? And could that be the mainstay of their argument here in order to prove that this was a mistake? And so therefore, um, not the same, um, not, not equivalent to what we saw in the Chauvin case. Professor Moran, you want to take that first? Sure. Um, yeah, I, when a prosecutor or a former prosecutor says this is a harder case for the prosecution, well, what that means, it's, it's, a, it's a better case for the defense. That's the flip side of the coin. Or um, as I think the defense attorneys would argue in this case, never should have been charged at all. I do think we'll see an aggressive defense. Um, we will see that they, they will argue that this was a tragic accident, but an accident nonetheless. They will. Um, they plan to present testimony from an expert who will say, uh, who will testify about um, how people respond under pressure in the in in a um, challenging uh, decision that you're making in the spur of the moment, and they and that people can sometimes make. Um, an accident like this one where they grab the wrong item now on the on the state they will say that the taser looks different it feels different it's carried on another side for a reason officers um, routinely are trained in this and that kim potter herself was trained just months earlier after i had been trained many times but also very recently about the danger of um, that a taser can present and how to distinguish between the two and so that's why they are arguing that she acted recklessly not that she intentionally shot dante right but that she acted recklessly the defense will say no she didn't she um it was a horrible accident and i do think that they're going to blame dante right for not immediately yielding to her uh the attempts to arrest Really, um, I just want to briefly touch back on something I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, which is this thirst for criminal trials to speak to um, whether someone's actions were appropriate or morally right. This is a really hard one in that sense, because it is a tragedy that Dante Wright died, and Kim Potter is responsible for that tragedy, I will say. Some people would disagree about even that point, and I think the defense might. I don't think there's any question that Kim Potter is responsible for the tragedy of his death and that he did not deserve to die and that there's really no such thing as justice for Dante Wright when he has been killed. It's a, it's a tragedy that I wish we could agree on that. But the criminal case is about whether Kim Potter acted with a conscious disregard for risk whether she acted recklessly. And either way, whatever the outcome is, some people will think it was definitely wrong. Yeah, and, and one thing too, in terms of race, is that once again, it'll get buried, you know, in, in a way that's probably unfortunate, in that the implicit bias um, may well have entered this case at the very start when they chose to make the traffic stop. And, and, you know, that probably won't be at the center of this case. It's going to be about the time of the shooting and, and what happened right before it. Um, I, you know, in terms of what the defense will be, I'm, I'm often surprised still by what <laughs> defense attorneys end up focusing on. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, I would defer to Professor Moran and, on, on uh, anticipating, anticipating that. I can tell you that for the prosecutors, I think they're going to rely very heavily on, on training, on experience, and on how different these two things are. Um, you know, I, the prosecutors, I'm sure, are going to want to bring in a taser and the service weapon. Um, and if possible, even have, have them, you know, once they're properly secured, be sent back to the jury room so they can see it, feel the difference in weight and things like that, because often that's what's going to make the difference. 
such a, a, a great point. Um, there, there's a, uh, in a couple of different ways, I'll say something, I'll share something that's a little personal, but I think relative to what we're talking about, um, I just need a second to pull this up. We have another question about vigilantism, which I'll be asking both of you, but before I do that, I just wanna mention uh, what I think is an important uh, point that, or emphasize an important point that Professor Moran raised. These are the two uh, North, uh, excuse me, Virginia officers that were responsible for the murder of one of my relatives back in 1938. They were ultimately acquitted of that crime. Um, my relative was a, a purported bootlegger and he was uh, in a high speed chase with uh, the police in Danville, Virginia. Uh, they fired at his tires to prevent him from crossing the state lines into North Carolina. And when they did that, the car careened out of control, killing him, his passenger. And as the car careened into a, a truck carrying two white men, uh, killed those two men as well. The officers were uh, charged with murder, not because of the death of the two black men, but because this caused such a stir in North Carolina in that moment that these two white men um, had been killed and people wanted accountability. They wanted, as Professor Moran put it, they wanted the, someone to be responsible for this. And ultimately what the court determined in that case, uh, these two officers were uh, acquitted, was that, the, um, that my relative was ultimately responsible for refusing to yield when the officers attempted to pull him over. When you talk about the history of policing in this country, and you can look back at you know, the long history and how this touches communities of color, um, that's a, a, a recent discovery for me in the history of my family, which carries forward to today. So when I look at Kim Potter even being charged in this case, and the charges being what they are, and, and, and the hope for at least not the outcomes that you got where the argument would have been, um, as Professor Moran talked about um, earlier, and certainly was made in that case, that the defendant, or excuse me, that the victim somehow invited this because they were engaged in some kind of criminal activity, as opposed to the onus being on the person who's entrusted as a du duly deputized officer of the law to be responsible in the care of weapons. Um, that's an important distinction. I think sometimes it's easy for us to say that nothing's changed. I think all, um, ultimately it's important for us to recognize the ways in which we have seen some change. Um, it is not uh, probably fast enough or, or uh, broad enough for most people, but I do think that we can draw hope from being able to recognize across uh, generations that we're in a different moment. It's still a difficult moment. It's still a lot of pain associated with this. There's still a lot of work to be done, but it's a different moment. Um, last question for both of you um, is on vigilantism. It's kind of an interesting question. It says, both cases involve vigilantes. I think we spoke to this a little bit earlier, but I'll read it anyway. Speak to this thread of vigilantism in, uh, in US history. Uh, the ability to arm yourself and engage with someone you assume is a criminal it has its roots in slavery and conquering the wild west of America. Um, and I guess they just want uh, your thoughts on that. We'll begin with you, Professor Moran. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot um, in the last week or so about, uh, we often have trials, uh, highly publicized trials where um, it seems like there's a different reaction based on uh, the race of the person reacting. Uh, and in the Rittenhouse case, I saw a lot of Black people expressing deep pain over his acquittal. Um, and you can't divorce that pain from our history. Um, I do think we're in a different place today, Dr. Williams, a slightly better place in hopefully uh, many ways. But um, we have so many, we have such a long history where um, whether or not Mr. Rittenhouse himself was justified, there are many white people who have been able to carry guns and uh, engage in violence with little to no repercussions. And there are, I saw so many black folks saying, if this had been me or if this had been my son, um, that would never have been allowed. And in that there's so much truth in that history as well. And so um, I think that's why understanding context is so crucially important. Yes, there are specific facts that, uh, that may or may not justify a verdict in a case, but that doesn't change the pain that people experience of seeing what seems like yet another symbol of inequality or um, injustice that can happen or ways white folks can escape being held accountable. And in some ways, I think, I think 
Minnesota carries that pain into the trial that's going to start tomorrow as well. Um, independent of how it turns out or what outcome the jury ends up reaching, I think that's a reality that we all need to understand and grapple with. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a country that often celebrates vigilantism. You can go down to Northfield in September and they have a celebration of the townsfolk that took out after the uh, James Younger gang and, and uh, you know, stopped them. But what we see now is a convergence of a proliferation of firearms and the idea that a good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun with the historical um, trend towards racial bias in our country. And that means that some people, when they think about who's the good guy and who's the bad guy, it's gonna be rooted in race. And when that gets to the level of lethality, where it's the good guy with the gun killing the bad guy with the gun, we end up with cases like McMichael and uh, Ahmaud Arbery. Thank you um, both for, for those answers. I think in a way, you know, our colleagues in justice and peace studies teach about epigenetic harm, kind of the long-term impact in communities when you have justice denied in this way and the impact that that can have, not just in terms of people's perception of the criminal justice system, but within the community itself and expresses itself in, in various ways. I think we saw that on the eve of the Chauvin verdict um, and in the aftermath of the killing of Dante Wright, when you have Maxine Waters come to town and um, stoke some controversy by saying, well, if the outcome isn't what we expect from the Chauvin trial, then people should get in the streets and stay in the streets without recognizing that we can go back to the late 1970s when Maxine Waters is a young congressperson, um, excuse me, assemblywoman in California was taking up the case of a, a woman in that state in 1979 who'd been killed by the LAPD over a $24 um, energy bill. Um, and that case in that moment was the equivalent in California for what we feel about the Chauvin case in our contemporary moment. Um, I think history, uh, as you said earlier, um, Professor Osso, context is important. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Professor Moran, we have to uh, be cognizant of the fact that there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and so looking at, as you mentioned earlier, and I thought it was uh, brilliant, um, looking at, for example, the changing laws in Georgia, sometimes these episodes illuminate for us what needs to be changed in a very tangible way and where we need to focus our energies in terms of thinking much more broadly than what happens with individual officers in the streets, but what are the laws, um, the practices, the policies, the procedures that actually enable this type of behavior? I worry about the Rittenhouse doctrine that may emerge from this case in terms of armed people in the way that uh, Professor Osler talked about it, feeling like they can go out and arm themselves and, and, and go to a, a car dealership in another state uh, in response to urban unrest because um, there's a clear uh, message coming out of this case that you know, that type of, of action is, is permissible. And I think that's troubling um, in some sense. And yet at the same time, our faith in juries and our faith in our system um, demands that we respect the process uh, and that we look at this and talk about it in ways that I think ultimately allow all of us to be much more informed and engage in this in a, in a, in a civil manner that allows us to think deeply about how we can continue the process of perfecting our Republican form of government and democratic practice. That's what we take away. Final thoughts for you, um, Professor Moran. No, I'll be paying close attention to the Potter trial. And so I'm happy to field questions from interested community members as it goes as well, because I'll be watching closely. Also, you can follow Professor Moran on Twitter. Uh, great content, great, always excellent analysis there. Professor Osler, final thoughts? Yeah, it's just that, you know, this isn't the end of the road. <laughs> You know, we, we often look at these cases and we think, well, that is finally going to bring the discussion we need to have. And it doesn't happen on its own. Um, you know, the discussion happens when we bring it and we keep it going. Um, it can't be episodic. Uh, and and that's, that's the greater challenge than it has been throughout American history. Fantastic. Thank you both for your work. Thank you for participating um, with us today. I'm sure we'll be back. Uh, we have two major um, cases coming up here. So we'll be back as a community to talk about this again. And thank all of you for joining us. Take care.